coming up on Small Town Big Deal. <laughs> it's time to get medieval. I'm the king. It's a journey back to the days of yore. And a meal fit for a king. Summon the executioner. Plus, you'll meet a woman who fought through her battle with brain cancer with flying colors. Well, one color, that is. Very cool. It's a story that won't leave you feeling blue. Welcome to Small Town Big Deal. I'm King Rodney and this is my loyal subject and wench, Jan. I'm not so sure about the loyal part about right now. <laughs> you know, I thought that was too good to be true. Come, you get the king costume and I get the wench costume. <laughs> you know, we've got a lot of historical stories here on Small Town Big Deal. But none that have gone back in time quite this far or are this grand. Welcome to Medieval Times. It's a window into the past, a journey of a thousand years to a time when knights of the realm battled for honor and chivalry was a way of life. Then let the entertainment begin! Over the last 30 plus years, nearly 60 million people have experienced medieval times dinner theater and tournament at one of their nine castles in the U.S. and Canada. The small town connection to medieval times will be revealed later. For now, we're headed to the Dallas venue to get an up-close look at how this royal spectacle comes together. Strapping young knights jousting, sword fights to determine the champion, incredible displays of horsemanship, plus a royal feast you're supposed to eat with your fingers. I'm so there. You know, this is as close to Broadway as a dinner show is going to get. Performances are tight. Lee is Medieval Times' creative mastermind. He's been with the show since 1987. We create our own music. It's recorded by symphony orchestras from around the world, the choirs. You know, we spend a great deal of money in special effects and lights. We create and manufacture our own costumes. And you feed us. Right. You know, that's the other thing. There's a lot of great entertainment out there, but you don't even get a bag of peanuts with it. You know? <laughs> right. The Green Knight. When you're cheering in a Spanish medieval castle, go big or go home. That's what I say. About 50 miles north of Dallas in Sanger, Texas, is Chapel Creek Ranch, home to the all-important four-legged stars of the show. It's in this small town on 250 acres of gently rolling hills that Medieval Times raises its very own Royal Equestrian Company. In particular, the prized breed known as Andalusian, or here, the pure Spanish horse. You grow your own Andalusians. Correct. Uh, Medieval Times has their own breeding facility, so this is where all our horses come from. In fact, Medieval Times is the largest breeder of Andalusians in the entire country, averaging 20 new foals a year. Why so many Andalusian Spanish horses and not just quarter horses? The Spanish horse is actually is known as the king of horses and the horse of kings. So these horses were actually used in medieval warfare powerful muscles, they are perfect for the airs above the ground, which the ones you saw on the show, when they do the labat, when they jump and kick, when they walk on their hind legs, all those maneuvers were, uh, were used during the medieval wars. So that's why we keep the tradition of using the Spanish horse to represent those maneuvers in our show. If I sit back, oppa. It's all about horse and rider being in sync. The way that I sit and where I touch the horse and the sounds that I make, it's like playing an instrument. You just have to put all the buttons and keys where you want them, make the cues very clear and simple, and let the horse do his job. 
To ensure that the bloodline is preserved, each Andalusian undergoes a rigorous examination by a visiting colonel in the Spanish Army, whose job is to certify a horse as being Spanish purebred. 168. Colonel, when you come, what are you looking for? Very specific measurements that they need to meet for the neck, the legs, the, the whole parts of the, of the horse. A fully trained Andalusian can easily be worth upwards of $50,000. So it's no wonder they get the royal treatment, including daily baths, elaborate hairdos, and wardrobe to die for. After one of the horses has performed for many years and given up his talents, you know what? He gets to kick back and retire right here where it all began. Well, this Correct. looks like a pretty nice retirement home. Yeah, do you have any places for people here? <laughs> We could find a way. Yeah. <laughs> and when we come back... Is the black swimming? Quite a bit, quite a bit. Rodney gets a medieval makeover. <laughs> He's doing it. And Jan gets on her high horse in a good way. Yay, there you go. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. That's when we come back. You're watching Small Town Big Deal. Yeah! Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal from medieval times in Dallas, Texas. We've been getting a behind the scenes peek at just how this incredibly popular regal extravaganza comes together. Now all that's left is for the two of us to suit up, mount up, and start getting medieval on you. Looking great. For me, that means working with these incredible Andalusians and their head trainer, Javier. You must be a very patient man. Well, you obviously are. Look at how you are you with me. You have to be. You have to be. And your majesty, this will be your cape. <laughs> I'm going to finally get a chance to rule the roost. Feels good. All right. May I present Rocky the First? <laughs> if my friends can see me now. I think it was a really bad idea to put Rodney in that king costume. Yeah, it feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> Any king worth his salt has got to be able to defend the realm. It's a different kind of strength. It's, uh, you know, working out, going to the gym, staying fit helps, but it, yeah. this is the kind of strength that matters. You want to hold it like a firm handshake, okay. and boom, and use the force on the edge. Yeah. Just kind of move and stalk. Meanwhile, over on the more civilized side of the arena. There you go. And pick up the reins a little bit. You can go a little bit faster. He, he looks too loose. Gentle squeeze, forward. This is a workout. If anybody thinks it's not, think again. Being on the night shift is tough. Besides appearing in up to eight shows a week, these guys train three to four hours each and every day. He's one of the toughest guys I know. Look at that. How forward. Good, good. That's that fine. just wore me down, the little bit of training we were doing. Your right hand down, there you go. And then just start traveling sideways. Up. <laughs> <laughs> we just made the Jan maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> so don't forget. <laughs> you got more than that, I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really hoping that I can get the horse to do the Spanish walk. And sit back. Lift him up a little bit. Very nice, very nice. Good boy. Yep, yep, he's doing it. <laughs> oh my goodness, Javier! We did it. There you go. You got one more in you? I like it. Okay, we're gonna go sideways. Very good, very good, nice. We're gonna do the bow. Oh, oh my gosh. All right, some big weapons now. You look what's it inside the ring. Elbow high, look, you're strong enough already. And you run straight through it. And the faster you go, the easier it is. Oh, close, almost. All right, should we try long reins? Let's do it. Kind of like let them drop a little bit. Take and give, take and give. Let the reins slowly slide through your fingers. There you go. Hey. Here we go. One, two, three. Yep. Yay, there you go. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. See, you did it. You're a good teacher. Oh my gosh. But all these great skills aren't performed only for the sake of entertainment. Medieval Times prides itself on a program of educational outreach. All the castles host field trips for local schools that teach history in a fun way. It was really exciting. You kind of just got caught in it. 
Like you were really there. Do you know what was going to happen when you're night one? No. I was very surprised. I, I just thought he was greeting me, and then I was, I was, I got really excited. The latest production even weaves an anti-bullying message into its storyline. And we use our medieval characters in a series of four vignettes to teach the kids compassion, understanding, respect for one another. Those themes not only come from the code of chivalry, but they're, they're universal from 1,000 years ago today. We're, we're really hoping it's going to translate That's to so the important. students in this environment. It's really needed in America. Then. It, it is. is. It Agreed. Is. Right there, right pointed right there at the sternum. Now, it's one thing for me to try out all these medieval tools with two feet on the ground, but to do it at 30 miles an hour from a saddle? Even though I may look like a king, this old farm boy came up with a pretty neat solution. Who needs a horse when you got a deer? You know, I'm just going to brag on myself if Jan does it. I mean, I was two for two with the tractor jousting. Rodney, you were going like one mile an hour. I don't know about Jan, but I could sure get used to being a royal. You know, we have some really great subjects. It's great to be king. Indeed it is, my lord. After all of your sword fighting and horse riding, I'm sure you've probably worked up quite a kingly appetite, eh? Absolutely, I have. Would you like something to eat, my lord? Sure. Very well. Well, this looks good. Your feast is served, my king. Summon the executioner. You know, I think he enjoyed saying that just a little too much. Rodney's a royal, all right. Maybe royal pain is the best descriptor right now. Jan? That didn't last very long. Up next, turning the indigo plant into the color blue was a dying art, but it helped one woman live again. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. You know, every now and then a story just kind of hits us out of the blue. And that's exactly what happened when one of our producers found a blue handcrafted scarf. Well, that scarf led us to an amazing woman and a powerful lesson in determination. Move it under the water so it gets in the creases and crevices, but don't splash. This is Lydia Beeson. She can talk a blue streak about indigo. Blue dyes and purple dyes were for royalty. Uh, creating the dye or creating art with it. You can take it out very gently. Put Wait, it over this. it's green! It's green! Are over. you punking me? Comes out lime green and then it'll start oxidizing as the air hits it and it'll start turning a little darker and a little darker. And but Lydia wasn't always so chatty. The deepest, darkest blues that you want are about 200 dips. Oh! <gasps> In fact, she lost her ability to talk and so much more when brain cancer struck. Basically, you know, your brain's kind of like a hard drive and it was, mine was wiped clean. I didn't know my children or my colors or how to read or, or anything and I couldn't move. A wife and mother of seven, Lydia has endured a harrowing battle with brain cancer. It was a fight that included two surgeries and life-altering complications that would have had most of us giving up. I had nine different therapists, so I had a cognitive therapist, a speech therapist, a recreational therapist, everything. And they um, raised me from basically the skills of an infant. Here we are with the fine motor skill. But Lydia wanted a more rewarding way to work her brain and her hands. Oh, neat. And she yearned yeah. for purpose. I wanted to create and do something productive instead of just squeezing a ball. So I started dyeing indigo. And soon I had piles and piles of indigo. Walk into any room in her house and you know Lydia's not exaggerating. Items dyed with natural indigo are everywhere. In fact, her passion for indigo got so big, one Thanksgiving her family had an important meeting about it. They said, Mom, we're having an intervention. You're addicted to indigo. <laughs> and you have to sell it. 
I said, you know, I don't want to mess with the money and all that. She said, well, we have a plan. You can produce all you want and I'll take care of the sales and Dad will help deliver. We'll keep enough to get more supplies and we'll donate the rest to brain cancer research. Now that is a win-win idea. The indigo then became part of your therapy. The indigo is wonderful <laughs> therapy. Who looked at this and said, hey, I think this is going to make a beautiful blue. <laughs> Lydia starts with the green indigo plant, which is fermented and agitated in large tubs. And then there's a little bit of sediment at the bottom. The sediment left at the bottom is dried, leaving a dark blue indigo powder. Oh, look at that. The powder is mixed with a precise amount of lime and natural sugar, like fructose. Indigo is not water soluble. You have to coax it to adhere chemically to fibers. We put that in. Next, the laborious Water. dyeing process. The more dips, the darker and richer the color. The unveiling is so exciting. It's like <laughs> Christmas. So it's a t-shirt, right? Yes. And this one's an infinity scarf. Oh, that's beautiful. Lydia's daughter, Scarlett, helps sell these unique creations on Etsy in a shop called Island Indigo Gals. And her husband delivers to boutiques near her home in Buford, South Carolina. It's not a coincidence that she lives in an area called the Low Country and works with the indigo plant. There is a deep history here between the two. In the mid-1700s, in this part of South Carolina, a girl named Eliza Lucas Pinckney turned a green plant into blue and then gold. It soon became the second highest cash crop in the colony. Her father was British military and he was called back into service and she was to be in charge of these plantations. He said, you know, I gotta go. And she was about 16 at the time. Wow. Early planters were interested in finding that next big cash crop. Pinckney was one of many people who was experimenting with indigo production. She was successful, however, in learning the process of extracting dye and was able to even package her indigo and sell it on the British market. Shannon Eves teaches history at the College of Charleston. She speaks to the grim fact that indigo was only able to become successful here because of enslaved labor. If we're going to celebrate indigo and what it has meant to South Carolina, we have to also acknowledge the contributions of enslaved people, their labor, their sacrifice in producing that indigo. She could not have done it without them. They had the skills from the sugar plantations and the indigo in the West Indies. Without enslaved people, South Carolina would not have reached the status of being the wealthiest colony in British North America. After the Revolutionary War, well, Britain didn't buy our indigo, and then synthetic dyes were developed, and indigo slipped into obscurity. But today, Lydia is helping bring indigo back. And indigo has helped bring Lydia back, back from a debilitating disease and helping her fight to make it a thing of the past. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. You know, I'd like to know who the first person was that figured out that green leaves from a plant can make the color blue. Blue, and a beautiful blue. Yeah. But you know, my favorite part of that story was meeting Lydia and seeing how she's now taking all of her profits and putting it towards finding a cure for brain cancer. She's a special person. She is. And then did you get your fill of horseback riding? That horse was amazing. <laughs> so, however, I am never going to forget that you called me a wench. Well, it was just in jest. You know, I always thought you were pretty old fashioned. Now I know you are strictly medieval. I'm Rodney Miller. Now I rest my case. I am Jan Carl. <laughs> Join us again next week when once again we celebrate the great stories from across America. Okay, put your arm out. What? My worst nightmare, a man with a tape measure. You put that near my waist and you are dead. Get my 50-foot 50, 50 tape. <laughs>